Hello and welcome to this edition of Path to Power. I'm Matt Cooper. And I'm Ivan Yates. And no prizes for guessing what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about the presidential election that was concluded in the United States this week. And we're also going to be talking about our own general election. As we're recording this, Taoiseach Simon Harris has not as yet headed up to an Oris Anuktaran to request President Michael D. Higgins to dissolve the 33rd Doyle and call a general election. But by the time you're listening to this, that will have been done. But before we get to Ireland, I suspect that many of you might be expecting that we'll address the elephant in the room, Donald Trump's election as President of the United States. Come on. Ivan, bring it on, bring it on. No, Tell me no, all the no, things no. you want to say well, to Well, I, I do have a long list here, but the point <laughs> is this, that that, uh, that, that, that <laughs> I was going to say, how 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 will I wind my man up? And and, and I, I varied from one thing to the other, but I got a lot of texts. I got a lot of texts. And I, believe it or not, I, I do have some sensitivity to your situation <laughs> uh, because, because it is the talk, of, it is the talk <laughs> of the country uh, insofar as, is Matt all right? Will, will, Matt, will Matt need help? Or how is Matt going to get through this and all this kind of thing. So I said, Matt will be fine. Don't worry about Matt. Uh, so, but I said, keep listening uh, and don't forget to pay the six euro a month. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> the subscription. And, and, and people come up to me and say, I'm one of the six euros, you know what I mean? And and so on. So, uh, and thank you to all of those because the few of them have come up to okay. me as well and they're enjoying it. Yes. yes. And, and, and my less charitable side was I would kind of take a pejorative thing and say, do you remember when Maggie Thatcher sunk the Belgrano and they were all given out about and she said, just rejoice uh, in terms of, the, you know, the, the pro-Trump people are really, really, and a lot of those got in touch with me um, because they have felt for the last three months such heat that they couldn't say how they really felt about Trump. So how do they really feel about Trump? Oh, how they really feel about Trump is that uh, the whole strategy of demonising Trump was a busted flush that the public didn't buy into the 34 counts and so on because the feeling is that the justice system and the criminal justice system in the US is politicised. Uh, prosecutors are politicised, judges and even against Trump, the Supreme Court is politicised by him you know, with his majority. You know, it was jury that actually found him guilty. Well, yeah, well put it like that. I, 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 so I, they're against jury trials? Well, well put it like this. They feel, in, well, well, one person said to me in real time, and it was actually a Democrat said to me, this case doesn't stand up, the, the 34 counts and so on, uh, on the basis of the statute of limitations. It's 18 years. And why didn't he put that defence? Was it so Machiavellian by Trump, he actually felt it would be a turning point for his base, that it would motivate them, that, you know, the system was weaponized against them and all that good stuff. But for me, in all these things, it's it's not necessarily, we can talk about a Trump 2.2 government, what were the politics? Because I'm, I'm an election junkie and I'm looking at campaigning and what do I take from this? So first thing I take is, and this is very salient for Ireland, Another one bites the dust. So we've had three black swan events. In Ireland, the context of Brexit was a black swan event. Uh, once in a, a century, uh, COVID, uh, lockdown was a once in a hundred, uh, and World War Three, uh, not in our lifetime in Europe uh, with Ukraine. And every single incumbent government has got it in the neck. You know, we, we've talked about everything from Austria to Germany to France, right through to the UK, and now the US, the incumbent has got it in the neck. So... Uh, watch out. Uh, and when I'm doing all these predictions on the ground, I'm kind of coming up with totals for Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil. And I said, well, that just doesn't fit with, with the national trend. But I do think that there's a particular problem with the states. And that is that I think Elon Musk, uh, Elon Musk won the election mm. in part because there is, you know, so we'll take pollsters and we'll take TV stations and the media and the traditional media. Just leave aside all the personalities. I think they were rejected on this. I mean, I, there was one particular point on Monday and this poll came out in Iowa showing Iowa, you know what I mean? Iowa is a slam dunk for, for the Republicans. Uh, the Camilla was leading by three and so it's, oh, have we missed something here? 
And and I immediately went onto the bookmaker's side. Oh, what price is Trump now? He was one to six in Iowa. He won it by six or seven points. Mm. Like that was an erroneous poll, whatever way you hack it. Absolutely. And and and, and, and sorry, the polls can be explained. And this is good news for Fina Fall. Even people coming out of the booths don't like to admit that they voted for Trump. In other words, it was 50-50. Polls understate Trump. Fo- polls understate Fina Fall. So you know, so and how I do can't. You know ex- that? Are you creating Fina Fall with Trump? <laughs> no, what I'm trying to say is not everyone admits to their their true feelings. Oh, sorry, can I just say that? Yeah. I mean, if uh, just on when it comes to even the polls, I suspect that if you were to go and vote, or many people, if they were to go and vote in our proportional representation system, and if they voted down the ballot paper, and if they were asked by an exit pollster five minutes later, how did you vote? I'm not convinced they'd actually be able to replicate exactly oh, how Matt. they voted. Oh, Matt, that's a stretch now. <laughs> I mean, sorry, you mightn't want to admit who you voted for. No, you for. might want to admit, but you mightn't actually. If you voted all the way down 1 to 10, I'm not sure you'd be able to give exact so, order so, again. So, so I think traditional media and pollsters... Uh, sorry, can, can I just come in there on the Musk thing? Because yeah. I've actually, and I haven't sent it on to you in advance, I wrote yeah. a big piece for the Business Post about Musk um, who I find very, very interesting. And there was a terrific biography done of him a year ago by Walter Isaacson, which I would recommend to anybody. How do you to rate read. Musk? Dangerous. So how do you rate him as commercially? Don't oh, know, just leaving aside the politics. Oh, well, no, like, is he is he a whiz at business and technology? Oh, you see, I could take all day on this, right? Yeah. Um, well, SpaceX, well, for or against? SpaceX, no, you see, it's not as a... SpaceX is an extraordinary creation and he has done extraordinary things there. He's very interesting in relation to artificial intelligence and he's an early investor in open AI, but he's gone into other AI things because he is worried about how it might interfere with human's ability to keep control of things. So very interesting. But well, would he be that. a suitable member of the cabinet? Is no, well, I, 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 it's good. It, it takes a little bit of time to answer questions, <laughs> Ivan, at times. On Tesla, okay, okay. I think Tesla is a big con job, right? I think there are other uh, electric car manufacturers who are doing better, particularly the Chinese. Uh, and the valuation of Tesla is completely wrong when you look at it against other car manufacturers who are making electric cars. Now, it could be very useful to him to have a position in charge of regulation and all the rest of it in the Trump administration because this means he'll be able to bypass a lot of uh, regulatory concerns about self-driving cars and things like that. So that could be useful to Tesla, but I don't think it's a fraction of the company that people bring it up. In relation to Twitter, or X as he likes to call it, um, I think he's Rupert Murdoch on steroids. If you look at the influence that... Rupert Murdoch has had the malign influence that Rupert Murdoch has had over the decades in elections in the Western world. This Australian turned mm-hmm. uh, American national, like Musk is South African turned um, American. Uh, the malign influence that Murdoch have had has been multiplied and amplified by um, Elon Musk's control of Twitter and the social media sphere. And you can just, even the likes of the Wall Street Journal, which endorsed Trump, has written very critically in the last couple of weeks of how Musk has weaponized and just outright used for propaganda purposes that social media platform. So that's why I think he's a particularly well, well, dangerous well, I, individual. I, well, we'll agree on the fact that he had a big impact. Uh, Enormous. Uh, yes. Okay, now my main top line of the whole thing is I want to come down really hardly on the management of the Democratic Party. Mm. And I think, I just want to list all their mistakes. Right, the first mistake was they should have said from the get-go uh, when Joe Biden was elected, this man is going to be 80 when the next election comes around. This is a transition term and we're really going to work hard to find the next Obama. Absolutely. So and they, and, and they, they, they should have indulged him. They yeah. represented that in the last election. He was a one-term yeah. president. Of, uh, and then, of course, when he got his hands on the levers of power, Joe Biden's ego was such that he thought he could go again. And, you know, he was... He was the wrong person so, and so, he should have gone a lot so earlier that, than he that, did. That was the first mistake yeah. they made. They had no succession plan for Biden and they sle- they were sleepwalking in not having primaries and we actually called this in real time and then when the debate, the whole thing just collapsed and you know what I mean, they... they, they, they they were swimming with when the tide went out on 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 Biden there with no trunks on. The second the second point is that the Democrats have disconnected from a lot of ordinary people, because if you look at the migration issue, some of the people that are most anti 
illegal migration on the southern border and with good cause is that they had gone through a legal process themselves. One of the reasons why the Irish are declining their influence in the States is that nobody can get in anymore. And and that has been the position. And so therefore, the, the situation of people jumping the queue by being illegal and having a defective deportation system, the Democrats were completely tone deaf to that. The next mistake they made was thinking um, that a, 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 a that, that that America wasn't still a racial country. Uh, Kamala Harris was a very average candidate. She was a very indistinct vice president. She didn't in the last uh, almost four years identify herself and any issue she was assigned to like migration, she was seen to be a proven failure. You know, 55% of whites voted for Trump. They they just were tone deaf to that. Now, on the economy... Sorry, you, can I just say on okay. that before we get to the economy? Yeah. Coming there. So... Is what you're saying to that is is that America will never elect a woman, and they most particularly will not elect a woman who isn't white. Right now, yeah, right now, yeah, I think that's true, especially the, the way the whites feel threatened, and uh, I, I, I think, I think it is a racial country a lot more than other countries. But hey, scratch the surface deep enough, and there's plenty of racial views in Europe too, uh, white people. I, I'm not just, and they're not all the supremacists, East. but there's, certainly they prefer one of their own. You know what I mean? So, so I mean, that's just. I sometimes the truth is 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 difficult. Sorry, can I just say that if you do want to bring it back to home, I mean, there was to a degree, there was an element here in Ireland who were vicious against Leo Varadkar, particularly in social media, because of the fact that he was gay and that he was of partial Indian heritage. Mm. And the vast majority of Irish people are good people who looked beyond mm. anything about a person's sexuality yeah. or skin colour and judged him. First of all, thought he was very good, then they lost interest mm. in him, but it was on the basis of his political performance. And what, what was the first thing Fine Gael did when Harris came along? Oh, by the way, he's married with two kids. Uh, yeah. And by the way, and by the way, his father was a taxi driver and a barman. You know what I mean? That was all in contrast and to and what, Leo. And, what was, and we'll get to how the American election may the have The selling an principle of the contrast principle? Well, if you don't want yeah. a, a million pound house, I'll sell you a hundred grand house. We'll, you know? we'll also get to what how it might impact on the Irish election. But yeah. I mean, I think, and I'm probably jumping a little bit ahead here, but yeah. I think it was very obvious that one of the first things that Simon Harris has done as Taoiseach has been to become, shall we say, less generous towards immigrants. Oh, absolutely. He's changed the dial on that. Absolutely. Now, and I even noticed there was an interview with Neve Horan and Michal Martin and she said, well, uh, acceptance of Ukrainian refugees is waning. And he turned around and said, instinctively, has waned. And I thought, I thought that's a dial shift if ever I saw one. So I think it's not just uh, uh, Harris on that. Just to finish out, on the, on the economy, that when you actually listened to Kamala and leaving aside their playbook of Trump is an ogre, he's a misogynist, he's a rapist, he's all these things and, you know, he's a criminal and all and that. he is, he, and which uh, all should be disqualifying. <laughs> just because the majority voted for him Ivan doesn't mean that he's a suitable see, person when to be you president, get to the, yeah. and it also means he's still wrong. And he's still look, I, have de I deal with people all the time who've lost elections for forty years, and and you you go up and you go down. When you get to the position that the voters are wrong, you are. F There's just no other way of saying it. that is just not a tenable position if you're looking for votes. Yeah, you know, the I'm media. On, I'm, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm okay, on a different okay, position. Okay, I'm just okay, looking at okay. and going so, about the man's suitability so for on office, the economy, and just because the majority said that they want him as president. The majority isn't always right. Okay, the other mistake they made was Tim Waltz was a bad choice. Yeah. He was a bit of a bozo. Um, so, on the economy, you know what won it for him? You know what won it for him? And it was a dead simple thing. No tax on tips. Mm. The amount of people I heard in Vox Pops and randomly, particularly younger people who said, well, I actually have three jobs and no tax on tips will change my income by 30, 40%. And you know what? Sometimes the answer can be very simple. They did not want to hear about transgender. They did not want to hear about abortion, rated 14% on the list of priorities. And that was Kamala's strong suit. But she already had that vote wrapped up. 
you know, mm. the young feminist vote, which is fine. And I, I get that as an important thing. And I get that very much as a principled issue. But you know what? If your playbook on Trump of demonization isn't working and if abortion isn't connecting, you want to focus on what are the issues. It was interesting, though, the exit polls and watching, I opted for CNN's coverage the other night. I, I'm not surprised. Before I went to bed <laughs> at about Sweet 2 o'clock. Jesus, Matt. I mean, like, uh, you know, like they, they put it like this. I'd say that they haven't called it yet, have they? <laughs> <laughs> so you didn't see it. No, John, John no, I would is, never watch CNN. John King is very, very good at the election board and going through yeah. the numbers and all the rest of it. But they also had a guy's name, I can't remember, on doing the exit poll stuff. And I thought it was fascinating because it was showing things like immigration was actually only about 10 to 15 percent, depending on the they state. They mightn't admit it. That's true, but hold on. What they did actually go for, and abortion was down around the same level, yeah. right? So the issues that were coming up, the two big issues were economy and the fate of democracy. And you know what's really interesting? The fate of democracy, you might immediately have thought that's good news for Kamala Harris because that means that all the fascist stuff is actually mm. landing home and people are voting mm. because of that. But actually there was another way of looking at that and that that was because of what Elon Musk was doing on social media and Trump was saying that they were the defenders of democracy and that yeah, the threat I, I actually, the I actually, That was a point at which I, I, I flipped. I was watching it on, 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 because you know, the BBC and RT took coverage from other stations mm. and so on. And I saw this thing, 30% issue was democracy. And I said to myself, what's that? Like, that's like saying that the voters are the problem. How did you think that was going to connect with people? You know, the democracy issue is sorry, both, the sovereignty both, of the people. Yeah, but both, both sides fought this whole thing that, I mean, Trump said and Musk are saying, if you don't elect Trump, they say, there will never be another election. Now, they were actually causing the fear among voters that these people are going to strip you of your rights or they're going to bust in the immigrants who will all be turned well, into I, Well, I just think that's the depth Democrats to which the de Democrat arrogance got to. The other thing is, when we we look sorry, back. I can't, sorry, <laughs> explain. I've just explained to you, or I said to you in relation yeah, yeah. to um, what many people on the right were saying to try and encourage, and you turn and flip that and say that's democratic arrogance. Yeah, yeah, because because what what they were saying was that really the public shouldn't be trusted to give a verdict on Trump. They wanted the criminal justice system to give a verdict on Trump. That and 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 and, and so therefore. And even in some of the points you've made, like the problem here is the voters. You just can't. That's not a sustainable result. The final point I want to make on uh, the c disaster of, of the Democrat campaign, and it happened in real time. You would have thought they learned something from 2016. Because I actually think Hillary wasn't that bad a candidate and everyone dumped on her personally. But the deplorables was mm. a seminal moment. Garbage was out of the same playbook. You know, instead of deplorables, the people who support Trump, his base are garbage. Like, what part of that did you think was a good idea? Yeah, look, it obviously played badly. But again, did you not hear what Trump and all his acolytes have been saying about Democratic voters? They had been at it for months, constantly, constantly, constantly. And then Biden slips and says it once and says, oh, dreadful, look at the way he's talking about us. Look, I mean, the, the propaganda wars were absolutely extraordinary. Yeah, I know, and there are election. culture wars involved here. And, and America is a deeply uh, d divided uh, society. And we can go on to talk so about this. The... One of our listeners was in touch with me as well and made a really interesting argument to me, which I'll, I'll get, put to you. And uh, it was about, you know, the, the belief that women would swing it for Kamala Harris. And his argument that he put to me very strongly was that you know, when Trump said, you know, whether they like it or not, which I thought would be a seminal moment, that yeah. that would be something that women yeah. would react against. Now, his argument, and I'm not saying I agree yeah. with this, but I'm, li I'm willing to listen to it, was that actually there was a constituency of women who liked that who actually are so conservative that they believe this thing, that men are the providers and that they are in some way subservient to their men. Well, what do you think of that? It's a bullshit point. I mean, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not, that, that is actually just a kind of mischievous point. So the Democrats spent, they raised a billion, a billion dollars mm. and, and they flushed that down the toilet. But the other point you've got to do is stand back and look at the humanity of this. Leave all the politics, all the party politics out of it. This man is 78. 
This man has been through court processes. This man is the first man since 1892 to have been rejected by the public and to win back the presidency. Is there any part of you, because you, you, you've you dealt with a lot of mm. egomaniacs and uh, different people in, in business and so on, who have, you know, a, a ego the size of not Croke Park, giant stadium or whatever it is. And, 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 and is there not some party say, Jesus, his zest for this and his whole drive, he just is a remarkable man. Oh, is- like Whether that's for good or bad, he just is a remarkable person. And I think a force of his personality uh, just made it very difficult for any Democrat candidate. Well, I'd, I'd give you a theory on that, right? And this is just the theory in the rest of it. I think his motivation... He's mad, is <laughs> No, 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 no. His motivation, there was a number of motivations. One was the ego thing, that his ego as such is that he had to be seen to win. He would do anything to win and he wanted his place in history and this puffs up that extraordinary sure. ego. So I think that's one thing. I think the second thing was, was the desire to stay out of prison. Okay. That he also saw that if he won, then he was untouchable when it comes to legally for anything that he has actually done. Uh, and I also think that it's possible that he will love the trappings of power returning to the White House, but that he'll be essentially, he may be, a part-time president. Oh, he's going to play golf. I think yeah. that too. He's going to get the biggest smarts into the room and he's going to go off mm. to play. He's not running. Like one of the things he said was, I've done 901 rallies. I'm not doing any more. The fact that this man isn't campaigning anymore, I actually means he's going to relax the cax a bit. Yeah. So we'll see then who actually gets into the positions of authority and what it is that they will actually the jo- do. Some of the other things he did, the, the McDonald's thing, the garbage truck, the Joe Rogan thing, were was good campaigning. Well then, bring it to Ireland and what we can learn from that. Because I, one thing really struck me in the last few days, and I was listening to loads of podcasts in relation to the American election, and a sort of an alarm bell went off for me in relation to that the Democrats were putting everything into the so-called ground game. And yeah, which was pretty threadbare when it came to it. Well, no, apparently, no, they were out knocking in doors, but you know what was happening? The doors weren't getting answered. And but, they were finding answers they didn't want to. But sorry, the point is. Yes, right? okay. No, go and with this because I want to talk about this. Yeah, yeah, because it does seem that it was the social media where it was won. It was on the likes of podcasts with Joe Rogan and things like that. It wasn't the traditional way by television uh, debates and television interviews and the rest of it, although the two TV debates were very important in their own way. But it just seems that there has been a shift in change as to how you actually reach voters. And I just wonder, like, because I think the big thing in our election is going to be knocking on doors, introducing candidates, getting them known at local level. But how much of it actually is at a more overall level that people will be voting for the candidates that they like, who they think they're voting by proxy to be Taoiseach. Well, there's, you know, 350 million plays 5 million. In other words, Ireland is a village yeah. and everybody knows everybody and there's just a completely different culture in a tiny country. No, but what, what I actually, and I'll tell you who comes out of this really badly, because uh, one of my reference points previously and not anymore was the rest is politics USA. Scaramucci, can scratch mm. off with himself. I mean, like he is a busted flush. He told 15,000 people in the O2 that there was no way Kamala could lose. He absolutely, he kept doubling down on it. And, you know... He also, he, tells, he also tells people, as I know, because I've interviewed him yeah. to buy... Uh, Cryptocurrency. <laughs> yeah. So he, he got sacked, he had to switch sides and he made a complete tit of himself. And like I, 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 I'm just so annoyed at myself listening to a few hours of that and I, I just said, this doesn't seem right to me. And like they were completely wrong. And I don't know if they did it uh, mischievously, but the point I want to make is that they had this thing where Katty Kay went into a particular state, I think it was in Philadelphia, where she went with this, you know, as... Uh, they bust all these people in. Oh, yeah, yeah, I heard yeah, that yeah, one yeah, and well, Okay, yeah. so what, what did I explain to you last week? The way an election machine works is you have to have the local people who know yeah. who's at home. Mary, are you there? Are you clipping the edge out the back? You know what I mean? People will not talk to strangers. So bussing people in is a complete disconnect. You know, we need to take a break. We've been gabbing away so much the first 24 minutes of this podcast that we've barely mentioned our own election, which I think in itself might be significant. We'll get to that when we come back after this break. 
Welcome back. Remember, if you want ad-free listening, well, you can get it if you're a subscriber. If you go to the pathtopowerpodcast.com, you get details there of how it is that you get our second edition where we gab on about lots of other things that we don't have time to do in this free to you if you choose not to be a subscriber edition. So let's get to our general election. Can I just say one thing about Trump point? Two, two points. No, you know, is, and that is this. I think there is going to be a new logic that will pervade both Europe and America about Ukraine. So let's say we continue with the status quo. NATO, America, keeps supporting Zelensky, keeps supporting the Ukrainians. What are we looking at if that war went on for five more years? We're looking at Ukraine turned into a pile of rubble because Putin isn't going to stop. And I can see a scenario developing that the Ukrainians will come to the view, like they did with Crimea, that they'll need a settlement. And and I could be a wrong about a surrender. Yeah, we'll put it like this: a partial surrender uh, for the for the sake of peace in the rest of Ukraine. And I I I do think. Sorry, let's be and clear. Think, and will that keep Putin happy? Well, the, the, you see, the point is his initial. Uh, plan was to overtake Kiev and the whole lot uh, and uh, he won't get that. He'll just get eastern Ukraine. But I will stop him moving into Latvia, Lithuania, but like this, Estonia, I, 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 Poland. I get that point. I get that point. But you know what? The way politics works in the long term we'll all be dead. How will this work out in the next four years? And I, I'm just, sorry, I'm just predicting that I see a, a, a change coming about and it'll all be blamed on Trump, right? But Europe are looking for an excuse to stop the war. Well, there's going to be, for us here in Ireland, I mean, of the many, and we'll get to the economy in the second, but um, we benefit sort of like by stealth from the presence of NATO. We we don't want to be part of well, NATO. Well, we're freeloaders. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we, we want their defence. We're dependent on Britain to, for our airspace. So what's going to happen is, I would suspect, given on what happened during his last time, he is going to reduce funding to NATO. And the European Union is going to have to make up the difference. And I think we're going to be actually told by our European Union colleagues, step up here and actually start contributing. Yeah. And that's going to create a major political issue. And not just us, other uh, independent uh, neutral well, states. There are so. fewer and fewer of them in yeah. the European Union. Yeah, but, but put it like this, that could be your contribution could be in cybersecurity or it could be in a particular area um, of, of, of NATO. But I think I said this to you before, and I mean, I think there is a belief in Eastern Europe that, you know, it's not just the freeloading that we do on the back of NATO, but, you know, we looked for support in relation to Brexit. We looked in support when our economy yeah. crashed and we take a lot, but there's an expectation that we have to support those in the East in the way that they had to support so us maybe in the So maybe we'll talk about the tariffs and we'll talk about the corporation tax, but, you know, th these are existential threats to the Irish economy and FDI here. And I suspect that that will become something of an issue in the general election. I don't know how much of an issue because if you think back to 2020, one of the failures of the outgoing government was reward us for dealing with Brexit. And nobody gave oh, yeah, a damn. Yeah, yeah. And these sort of big economic... But then I suppose if you look, it's always forward-looking. Elections yeah. are nearly always forward-looking. And if, if, the, if the government parties start saying, well, we can't take more risks with the economy when we already have the risk with Trump, I suspect that's something that they will try and push on the electorate. So where, where do you want to go with the Irish election? It's, it's 22 days, it's kicking off. There's the it's, that's it, what's going to spark it to life? Because, look, think about it, right? We're here... And we have this podcast, which is mainly about Irish politics. And for the first half hour or so about it, we're talking about Trump and... Ah, because that's only once every four years you'd be... Like, yeah, but, it, it, like but, was a seismic kind of event. It was a seismic yeah, yeah. event, but it's been running, it's been dominating the airwaves and the uh, media coverage yeah. and social media. Well, that media will abate, that. that will abate. But I wonder what's going to spark interest in the Irish general election. Is this going to be, I mean, you, you, you exited in 2002. So you probably were sort of already looking to the beach and all the rest of it and stuff. Okay, I'm sure you went out and canvassed on behalf of those who I were did. going to replace yeah, you and yeah, the rest yeah. of it. But if you remember rightly, that was an election which failed to spark. There was very little. It wasn't like the 99 election where there was the, uh, the you know, the, do you re-elect the rainbow or do you go with the Fianna Fáil PD opposition? Yeah. The, the 2002 one wasn't particularly exciting. The 2007 election was overshadowed by Bertie Hearn's personal finances. But again, people actually went for what they actually had. 
I just don't get the sense, even from the people I'm talking to who are really interested in politics, that we've that this election campaign has caught spark yet. Maybe by the time by the time this is heard by people after we've recorded, something will have happened. But I'm just wondering, what is it that's going to happen to get people really engaged with it? Well, well, that is a sign of contentment. In other words, that and I, I have spoken to an awful lot of people because I'm doing these news talk 43 constituencies. And in the last week, I was spoken to over 30 TDs. I say, look, these opinions are my own. Tell me what you really think is happening on the ground in your constituency. And there was one, one, one guy from Galway and I th- he put it very well. He said, I lost my seat in 2020. Here's the story this time. He said there was absolutely... And this was before COVID and and before uh, Ukraine and all of that good stuff. And he said there was palpable anger and hostility to Leo and hostility on the doorsteps. And I could get, he said, I've been canvassing for the last two months. And yeah, there'll be always people who don't support you or whatever. But the, the, the mood music is completely different. The antipathy to the government isn't there. And there's a prevailing sense of the devil you know and all of the in the middle class areas. Now, not necessarily in, in the more disadvantaged areas and not necessarily amongst young people. But the, the, there's certainly a, a feeling that the centre will hold as a top line issue. So therefore... The, the the observation you're making is actually a conclusion almost that, you know, the visceral nature of, of, of you know, the drove uh, kind of uh, an anti-government sentiment. And that could have been with the reduction of the pension age, could have been about the annual, uh, the one centenary celebration, which had happened in January over the RIC or whatever it was that was upsetting people. In my view, people are always cranky in February anyway. The, the fact that it's coming in to Christmas, you know, and and the Boris uh, thing, the, his big landslide for an incumbent, which is sort of completely out of uh, pattern and tradition with everything, was a December election. Is there a feel good factor that once Halloween's over, I'm looking forward to Christmas? You see, it's it's an amazing how things can change even in a space of less than five years. Because you mentioned that RIC commemoration, which got people very annoyed. I mean, this weekend, uh, Remembrance Sunday, Michelle O'Neill is laying a wreath in the north Sinn Féin for First Minister which is a good thing absolutely I think and I think and I I think we have praised her on many occasions for her inclusivity the fact that she has done things which may not necessarily be popular with hardline Republicans but which are important that when you're in the position of First Minister you have to be inclusive right just like a President of the United States should be inclusive of everybody rather than just his supporters but can you, you imagine, lost, Matt. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Can you imagine I can't it? sugarcoat this. You lost. <laughs> the popular vote, the Senate, the House of Representatives. You lost, Matt. But Sorry, can you get imagine, over it. Can you imagine if just five years ago, I mean, I think Irish teaching do lay wreaths at the remembrance ceremonies and stuff like that, but that would be condemned. How can you be doing that? They say, but now that Michelle O'Neill does it, it's not going to be an issue in this election. There is more of a sense maybe of calm. And I'm fascinated by the Sinn Féin position because I think for Sinn Féin, have, to a certain degree, they're putting the best foot forward now. They've regained their mojo. Um, and I'm just wondering about how well they're going. To, I think they're going to do better than a lot of people assume. I think when you get into an election campaign that people suddenly start uh, dealing with things and addressing the issues and I think they will come back and they will push the mantra of change and there will be an audience for that. Um, I suspect that it's a question of is Mary Lou MacDonald going to be as attractive as an alternative Taoiseach as she was to many people back in 2020 when, as I think we've said before, being excluded from the television debates made her something of a cause celeb for the disaffected. This is the elite thing. I don't think she has that going for her this time around. Um, Also, Sinn Féin, by the looks of it, has put in enormous work in relation to policy. Mm -hmm. And we spoke last week about David Cullinan, very detailed health policy. Uh, We have Owen O'Brien, very detailed housing policy. But you know what? And this thing... How much do policies actually mean to an awful lot of voters? Mm. How much of it, how much attention do they pay to the detail of policies? How much of it is that it's down to headlines and sound grabs and the like of personalities? So that for all the work Sinn Féin has done in preparing itself for government and putting the policies together, how many people are actually going to go for that? Well, you won't be surprised to 
in terms of an opening gambit, well, what's the what's the state thing? My default position is the bookies and the odds because they have to put their money where their mouth is. And right now, the betting is for Simon Harris to be Taoiseach, uh, the next Taoiseach is 8 to 13 or 8 to 15. Call it 4 to 7. Quite strong odds on. The next in the betting is Micheál Martin from 5 to 2 to 15 to 8, a little bit more than 2 to 1. And you can have what you like. So that doesn't make sense unless you believe that Fine Gael are going to have a significantly bigger number of TDs than Fianna Fáil. They do, and they do. They, in in terms because, of the most seats, the most seats, uh, Fine Gael are 8 to 15, uh, Fianna Fáil are 2 to 1 and Sinn Féin are 4 to 1. But how, even if it's the most seats, surely it has to be significantly more for Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil to have Harris reinstated as Taoiseach because... If there was, say, a difference of five seats between the two, mm-hmm. Michal Martin's going to say, well, it's my turn now. You know, we did the rotating Oh, no, 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 that, no, that, I think that's wrong. This, whoever gets the most will get the Taoiseach. It's a, the slate starts clean, right? Whoever gets the most will be Taoiseach. And that's why there's such a spurt on between the two of them. You see, the situation is that Fianna Fáil could argue, well, actually... We're now looking at the next general election. We'll just say in twenty twenty eight. Are you better off actually being the Taoiseach? Being the second the and let Jack election. Chambers be Taoiseach then, oh, and, let, sure. and let me hold go to the park. Michael like Martin that. doesn't want to go to Arsenal. Well, if he's not going to be Taoiseach, he'd love it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. He if he was going to be Taoiseach, yes, I agree. But what if he's you, not going to be, what do you make about the whole thing about age? I mean, he got a bit. Uh, I think you're he, the cause He blamed of that. me, yeah. He blamed us for the Cork Opera House because I had said about <laughs> the launch of the... He, he kind of turned on the whole criminal justice system. <laughs> so I had to laugh at all this. Uh, he said, Let's start. he was outside Bowdenstown and he said, are you, are you a bit of a grumpy old man? You know, Harris is briefing that you're a grumpy old man. He said, this all started, he said, when, Ivan, when I launched the, the book on Sophie Toscan <laughs> de Plantier and, and I, he said that it was wrong that she, you know, he'd never... Bailey had never faced trial and I said and like to be honest with you the word I'm hearing is that Harris is quite narky these days in fairness Uh, so they're all they're all very crotchety and even people like the one thing they're all agreed on is that Ivan Yates is a bollocks Well I'll tell you what I'll tell you what other person (laughs) thinks that Ivan Yates is a bollocks possibly and that would be Christopher Christopher O'Sullivan TD from West Cork because last week in uh, the subscription edition of uh, Path to Power um, you made a comment about whether he was actually living in his constituency. And I mean, I try to say, are you sure about this and the rest of it? And I think we should just say for the record that he is, as he is And he wrote a letter. A proud resident of Ardfield in West Cork. And he has lived in West Cork all of his life. I mean, I suspect, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, Christopher, for any uh, embarrassment or caused by this. And if your political opponents were trying to season this as some sort of a suggestion that you weren't fully committed committed to your constituency. But that's what goes on at times like this, isn't it? That there are people who give wrong steers to the likes of us, Ivan, and we have to be careful as to what we believe when we're told by people, even if we believe it to be in good faith, yes. it might not be. Well, so first of all, the reason why people are so frank with me, and I, I would have sent out again more than 30 texts to say, look, uh, I just need to get your genuine insights because this will be reflected as my opinions, my predictions. So I'm not going to be quoting you. But I have told you on this podcast and this week I met people before Profit, the Director of Elections, and went through all the 41 candidates they have in different constituencies. And we'll come back to that on the subscription one because I can see some new TDs and some existing TDs. Hold on. Let me be quite clear and speak directly to Christopher O'Sullivan. I always assumed that he was from Clonakilty and that he took Joe, Joe uh, Walsh's seat and that he was a very hard-working person. To my complete surprise, a Sock Dem source said to me, you know he's been living in Dublin. And I said, no, I didn't know that. And I reflected that in our conversation. And I'm very happy always with that because other people have told me about other TDs and candidates who don't live in their constituency uh, and sometimes relay it. And Because uh, I'm always... Absolutely iron clear, uh, iron rule, let the truth win out. You know what I mean? And and so therefore, if this is dirty tricks, I don't know. I don't know what the situation is, but I fully accept uh, the bona fides of what he says. 
Do you have to live in your constituency, though? Is it an essential? I mean, representing your constituency, because even in Dublin, there are people standing in constituencies who live outside the constituencies. They probably have roots in the constituency. I think, for example, in uh, Dublin Bay South, the two Fine Gael candidates live outside the constituency, but very much grew up within mm. it and probably can't afford yeah. to buy a house within and, it. And, and in the Cork East constituency, I won't name it, but someone said about a new candidate, you know he doesn't live in the constituency, he lives in another part but of so Cork. What? No, well, put it like this. You try canvassing and saying <laughs> don't live in the air. If I ever had knocked a door in Wexford and say, you know I live in Blackstoop, Senescorthy, it wouldn't have been a great By the look. Way, do you know who the sock down candidate in Kildare North is? You said last week it was Aidan yeah, no, no, Aidan Farley. Aidan yeah, yeah. Farley. And Aiden you just Farley. made a little slip of the tongue because there's a Feeney running for Fine Gael. Yeah, no, well, sorry. Let, yeah, no, that, let's, let's be clear. Aidan Farley, I did make some remarks about him which they found very offensive. And I tell you what, it was nothing. Uh, I said he was soulless. It was nothing to what I got a text about him to say. I sanitised it. But put it like this. You're absolutely right to put your finger on this. Things that people would whistle by their left ear when there's an election on, people are hyper, they're anxious, they see everything. Their jobs is, are on the no, line. Absolutely, no, I get that. And I've been that soldier. So I accept it. So, first of all, the bookies are saying Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil and independence is the even money favourite to be the next government. In other words, I actually couldn't see a price. I was doing what? For Fine Gael, Fianna Fáil to get a majority on their own. So in other the words, two of them without needing a third party. Yeah, yeah, so they, a third. I didn't see a price for that. But so then you have Fine Gael, Fianna Fáil and Independence is even. Fine Gael, Fianna Fáil and Labour is 10 to 1. Fianna Fáil, Fine Gael and the Greens is 16 to 1. And Fine Gael, Fianna Fáil and the Sock Dems is 20 to 1. So if you believe that the centre will hold and they'll get somewhere between 75 82 seats but short of a majority the combined total of FFFG which is where the sort of prevailing wisdom is if the election was held today now circumstances may change but when I hear you saying that there's apathy and there's disinterest and it's almost as if the election is in irrelevance Oh I didn't th- say that you know, you're paraphrasing way no, beyond no, 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 what no, I said. I meant from the point of view there's not this zeitgeist for change no, I'm not saying this. I mean, I, I just want to see how things develop. I'm just wondering what will be the spark because I'll give you a couple of examples. Sinn Féin are very much going on the waste element. So this week in the Dáil, yep. they hammered away I advised again. them to do that, yeah. Do you advise Sinn Féin? <laughs> to do that, absolutely. Wait, since I said you your only hope. I, I did it on this podcast. I said <laughs> the right. only hope they have is a shower of wasters. I said that is their only line. <laughs> and to go with Bikegate, go with the National Children's Hospital, go with all those things. I hope things. they don't end up thinking you're an Anthony Scaramucci. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it is their best line. Because, but, you know. Sorry, did you, did, will that hit though, Norma Foley, this idea that, well, the nine million for the... Um, the pouches. pouches in the schools, which I was critical of. I think I, I think the pouches are a great idea. I just wonder, should it be the parents should be paying for it themselves rather than in every school in the country, the state actually paying for them? Uh, but the issue for her was actually that she met apparently with one of the companies which provides these pouches. And Sinn yeah. Féin are trying to say that this is a scandalous situation. Is you, that saw what she, you saw what she said. Yeah. She said she was at this event and they had a sort of expo and she just sort of walked by the stand of the company. She ne- never had a formal meeting with them. But anyway, but I, assume, sorry, I, I'm sure I assume there was a competitive tending yeah, process. And I'm sure Sinn Féin will understand that because they have had difficulties with people turning up at launches of things in the North who they said they didn't see in their eye line. <laughs> Now, can I just go on to one area here, which I think is of interest in terms of the state of the parties as we face into the election. Um, Fine Gael versus Fianna Fáil, who will get the most? So I just want to give you some insights into that from the constituency sort of thing I've done. Let's be clear. In the greater Dublin area, Fine Gael are gunning for two seats in Rathdown, uh, in Dunleary, uh, Barry Ward and Maeve O'Connell and they have a definite chance. I'm not saying it's going to happen but there's a definite chance they're in the hunt for it. Like they'll be, if they don't make it, they'll be next best. Uh, that extends to the commuter belt uh, in the greater uh, Dublin area which would be Kildare North. They're looking at two seats. Um, so, the ground war as I see it is this. Fine Gael are stronger in the greater Dublin area and Fianna Fáil could go quite low there. They put it like this: they've Shay Brennan, uh, Mary Fitzpatrick, uh, Catherine Arda, all just missed the last time. Or and they kind of missed twice now in sixteen and twenty. That that 
then, so the only safe seats that I can see for Dublin, absolutely, is Daryl O'Brien and Jack Chambers. So, they, but I actually believe that Cormac Devlin and jo- John LaHarsh and Paul McAuliffe will hold on. And Jim O'Callaghan? Uh, yes, I do believe he'll hold on. But put it like this, but they're not, they're not, they're not seats you could take for granted. Whereas for Fine Gael, I, I, I think, you know, r- never lose sight of the fact that in South Dublin they ran last June 18 councillors and 17 of them got elected. They were very, very strong. So I think if the uh, green lunch is to be eaten, it's to be more likely to be eaten by Fine Gael. Contrast that. You go around the western seaboard. Donegal, Fianna Fáil, great chance of two. Fine Gael, no chance of any. Uh, if there's t- to get two seats, I would favour slightly Fine Gael over Fianna Fáil. But my sense of it is Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil combined will get three out of five in all the five seaters. In, in Clare, Fianna Fáil have a great chance of two. Fine Gael only have a chance of one. In Kerry, there's a great chance of Fianna Fáil, Michael Cahill getting elected to Fianna Fáil getting two. What I'm pointing to, and Fine Gael getting no seat there. Uh, so what I'm saying is this. The combination of not pulling off the Succession Act, Mihal being strong in Munster, that actually there that is it's a it's a tale of geography. In the more rural you go, the more councillors, the more incumbents that you have for Fianna Fáil. So I would say that right now I I'm sort of trending Fianna Fáil above forty and Fine Gael below forty. Just a couple of things before we finish this free to everyone edition of path to power and we have lots more that's in the subscriber edition and lots of gossip in the subscriber edition Um, there's two things I want to just focus on to finish here the economy was a big issue in the American election and when it comes to the economy I think people don't think about the overall figures as to whether the exchequer is in surplus or whether the what the tax revenues are they're actually thinking about their own cost of living issues and inflation has come back down to near zero here in Ireland and interest rates are falling as well. But the problem is, for many people, they're still paying excessively higher. They're paying way more for the costs of goods and services than they were paying two and three and four years ago. And that's the issue for them. It's not that they say, well, these prices aren't going up anymore. Prices are still too high for them. So I wonder how much that is going to be an issue here in this election. So I was doing this this, uh, estate agents, IPAV conference in the RDS across the way here. And Jim Power was one of the speakers. And he put up up a PowerPoint display of inflation. 2020 to now. And he said, overall, inflation is up 20%. But when you go into it, right, over the four years, electricity... Certain types of food have gone up sixty percent. Mm. So this is real. But then, will the government benefit be able to say, "Well, we mitigated against that. We gave you your electricity credits. You got your hundred and fifty. To year. which others will say, "You gave it universally. You gave it to the most wealthy people." Uh, but and, those and, are the people who are likely to vote, even if they didn't need it. They'll still be thankful, or will they, for actually getting that? So I'm just wondering how much this is going to play in as to whether the opposition is going to be able to say we'll make you better off than you were under this well, government. Well, well, let's be clear. Let's be clear, you know, and I said this before. We know money can't buy you love. We're going to find out if money can buy you votes. The absolute intensity under childcare and in the other podcasts we go into the manifestos and so on. They are throwing money. Like it's, what am I bid? It's uh, yeah. maximum 200 euros a month. No, no, maximum 10 euros a day and nobody, in, on childcare. There is nobody getting up saying we can't afford this. But one other thing, and again, this comes back to the Trump aftermath. Will there be, do you think, are there going to be anybody who's going to be playing culture war type politics I I suspect if there's one party and they can get on to me and give out if they think, I suspect N2 will probably try and play anti-woke culture type yeah. politics to an extent. That's very much in the sort of the, the yeah. Padder Tobin playbook. Uh, but at an individual level, would you expect that there will be quietly, even if it's not endorsed by their parties or it could be done by independents, that there'll be low level anti-immigration stuff and... Various no, and the migration is a big issue. I mean, and, I, I, and, and it could be quite nasty at local level yeah. just to try and win yeah. votes. Yeah, no, I and and uh, 
you know, uh, the, the government's response is going to be, well, look, from the 25th of March next year, the Ukrainians are going to be treated the same as IPAs. Mm. Uh, their social welfare is already being cut. Their free accommodation is going to go. We're not going to sign contracts for hotels again. So they are going to try and anticipate an anti-migrant backlash and say, we're actually doing something about it. We hear you. We're, we're working on it. Okay, that's it for this edition of Path to Power. This was recorded before Simon Harris went to Orison Uttaran, so God knows what might have happened uh, between that and you actually hearing this. But anyway, there's lots of other things that we're discussing on the uh, podcast, uh, the premium edition for subscribers. Uh, we'll be getting into the issues with the Greens in particular. Uh, and we'll talk about people for profit, profit, the number of seats, uh, lots of gossip and also... And lots of questions from listeners to and, be answered and, and, as well. And also, in terms of FDI, is a perfect storm now emerging? Okay, so that's all in the subscriber edition. Thank you very much for being with us and we'll be back again next week. 